It's November 18th, 2021, and this is Natural History Week in Rhode Island, which we designate every year to call attention to the important methodology that we use to investigate the environment and to the institutions and resources that make the practice of natural history possible in Rhode Island. Museums and systematic collections, zoos and aquaria, libraries, publishers, universities, and what used to be called learned societies, what we now call nonprofits, such as the Natural History Survey. So Natural History Week means it's time to announce the 2021 Rhode Island Natural History Survey Distinguished Naturalist Awards. Normally, we would be presenting these awards at the survey's science conference or our fall social. Unfortunately, due to the increase in viral biodiversity, we cannot do either of these safely. But we're not gonna let that stop us from recognizing very special people who have made important contributions. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them. Nominations for the Distinguished Naturalist Award are solicited from the general public and voted on by the Board of Directors of the Natural History Survey. This year's Distinguished Naturalists are oceanographer Dr. Candice Oviatt and Mabel Cindy Hempstead, who is primarily known for her botany, but had many other interests as well. Cindy was absorbed by nature from an early age during her childhood in Aurora, Illinois. She had one master's degree from the University of Minnesota in zoology and biochemistry, and she pursued a long and productive career in industrial chemistry, teaching, and research. At age 66, she embarked on a second career this time studying botany at the University of Rhode Island. She was very interested in aquatic plants and published research on Nymphaea odorata, the fragrant water lily, became a pillar of Watershed Watch and the Rhode Island Wild Plant Society, and many people met her through programs at those institutions. She continued her fieldwork until just shortly before her passing in 2020 at age 95. Many knew that behind her gentle and helpful demeanor, was a vigorous mind, always curious. The footage that follows comes from a long and wonderful conversation we had on Zoom with Cindy's children, Chris, Robbie, Joyce, and Margie. I was on the call, along with Professor Keith Killingbeck, the chair of the survey's awards committee, and Cindy's advisor for her master's degree, Hope Leeson, the botanist at the survey, and Pete August, also on the survey board, but in this case, serving the role of technical advisor. There is a complimentary video on our YouTube channel in which we present a Distinguished Naturalist Award to oceanographer Candace Oviatt. The survey gives two other awards, the Founders Award for Exceptional Service and the Golden Eye. Recipients of each of those awards for 2021 have videos on our YouTube channel as well. Thanks to Cindy's family for sharing their time and their memories and photos of their mother. I know you're gonna enjoy this video. See you out there. This is a, you know, this is an award, the Distinguished Naturalist Award that we give every year. We have done for many, many years, and it's, uh, it's a way of calling attention to people who we owe a debt to for what we know about Rhode Island. And it does sort of two things. It, it, you know, recognizes that that debt, and and it's a thanks, and it's also a memorialization of people who. They're very much present to us, but um, who knows in the future, we don't want their contributions to be forgotten. So this creates kind of a memorial for those so that um, future generations will know the history of, of natural history in Rhode Island. Um, and you know that's kind of the position that we see Cindy in as somebody who, who made important contributions and doesn't um, it's, it's really important that we don't forget that. Also, the the idea of um, people not they're not people don't do the things that this award recognizes in order to become famous or to 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 be like celebrities. But it, there's a there's a part of it where you you feel like if you show that you can be recognized. Um, for these kinds of things, hopefully it will encourage people to, to do more, to learn and to be curious and to record and to share. So there's a sort of a, an idea that maybe by doing this, we are encouraging people 
maybe not always with the thought of becoming famous naturalists, but but at least of, of understanding there's recognition in, in this and value that we value the contributions of these people. So anyway, that's kind of the way I, I think about these. And Keith has um, is going to give us more information about specifically the accomplishments that the Distinguished Naturalist Award recognizes. Yeah. So there are three criteria that we use in determining awardees. And a person um, could have any of these or, or one of them, or one of them or any of them, or all of them. Cindy had all of them, there are three. So advancing scientific knowledge or some kind of knowledge in the natural history of the state of Rhode Island. And, and or um, educating persons um, on, on the natural history or some aspect of biology, geology of the state of Rhode Island. And then uh, the third is bringing a, an awareness to the public of some aspect or aspects of the, the natural history of the state of Rhode Island. And as I just said, Cindy had all those. She did fabulous work, uh, starting with her retirement coming in to the University of Rhode Island for a second master's degree at, I think she, I think Cindy was 66 when she started that. But, but she, was, she was dynamite from, from day one. And if you just think about all the contributions that she made in that, let's say last third of her life, it was just amazing. From the wonderful work she did as a graduate student to Watershed Watch, Rhode Island Wild Plant Society, where she had a number of administrative positions, let alone leading trips, giving talks, writing articles for Wild Flora Rhode Island, all, all of those things. Even beyond all that, her, um, her caring for the environment, her, her wit and wisdom, were, were just amazing. And uh, I was lucky enough to um, keep up with her during that entire last the third of her life. I can say this about my mom. In, uh, in the span of time, when, from when I was very little to uh, even in recent years, I mean, I was with her on her last kayak trip. It never ended. You know, there was... It wasn't like, let's go out and find stuff. It was just the air she breathed. There was um, always an opportunity to point something out. It didn't matter what we were doing. We could be going to church. We could be playing in, a, in, a, in the backyard. We could be going on a bird walk. It didn't matter. I was just thinking about one particular episode. I was... Um, engaged in uh, bird watching activities because my stepson, uh, Shoibal Mitra, was very um, uh, active as a youngster. And um, it was just a joy to be with him and his enthusiasm um, was contagious. Well, my mom was part of that, as a matter of fact, and we would go bird watching as a threesome sometimes. So she wasn't all that interested in the birds, but she was interested in Shoei's ability to hear birds. And uh, she had, you know, a little bit of tinnitus, so it was difficult for her to, her to hear sounds. And Shoei, if you know him, is, uh, is exceptionally gifted in being able to um, discern a half a dozen species in the trees where you and I would see and hear nothing. And uh, she was always impressed with that. And, and uh, we would go birdwalking together down in uh, Truston Pond. And I remember one day going with her, and it was Shoei was young, and I was... Um, kind of, well, I was shipping out. So it was fun to be home. You know, home was sort of a vacation, a whole row of Saturdays. And um, we were walking in Trustum and came upon a tree that I didn't recognize. And I just asked her casually, you know, without thinking. That's just the way it was with her. You know, you just sort of expected her to know. And it was, um, it wasn't even a thought. It's like, oh, mom, what's that? That's an odd looking tree. She says, oh, yes. You see the leaves? Do you see how they're 
opposed. You see the little branches, they're all horizontal. And uh, these leaves have a particular shape. She said, that's a tupelo tree. And it was my first introduction to a tupelo tree. And uh, for some reason it struck me and it was just one of those moments that sticks. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Rob. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Well, thanks, David. And thanks, Keith. I just joining, of course, so I didn't get to hear, but I caught part of what Chris was saying. And uh, all I can say is uh, what an honor and, and um, thanks for remembering her so much, so much. And, and uh, um, yeah, I was going to say that um, uh, I was so surprised and, and just I, it was the nicest thing to hear when Keith called and said that you had decided to give her this award. And all I could think of is that she would just be smiling. I mean, she would just be, <laughs> you really did, you all knew her. So you knew that she was not um, a self promoter. Um, but she, especially uh, in the last 30 years of her life, she, she became more and more relaxed. And I, and I think she genuinely would be happy and smile at, a, at such a recognition um, as a, I mean she would probably just kind of brush it off but I know it would make her happy yeah. um, she really this was her life these were this was her excitement observing the things around her and and uh, never tired of, of of that curiosity that drove her I guess I mean it just never wore her out it was the opposite another thought that that struck me was, um, you know, it's on the same level as the Tupelo. It's not only the very specific thing of her instruction or sharing her curiosity, but it's that it sticks with me for 30, 40, 50 years as if it was a thing that was just in the other room. And it, it I don't know, maybe memories like that as you get older, it's, it sort of comes out a little bit of the shadows, but um, one of these with her is um, the search for the paper bark birch. And uh, I don't know if Joyce and Robbie ever experienced that with her, but um, there was a point where she was uh, curious about the paper birch bark. And I was too. It just sort of looked cool as, I don't know, maybe she derived some interest from our childhood curiosities. I have a feeling that's partly true. I'll come back to that. But um, it just so happens that in the house we lived in on Ten Rod Road, there was, um, you know, uh, Route 102 had been built, I don't know when, maybe in the 50s, it was widened and made out of concrete. And so that there was this meandering ancient path called Ten Rod Road, you know, maybe the old sheep path actually coming down from Connecticut. Yeah. And there was a loop of this in front of our house and what was in between the, the old Ten Rod Road, just this one lane, path and the four lane cement highway was this island of trees and, you know, damp ground because it was trapped between the two roads. And uh, when it rained a lot, there was uh, sort of an ecosystem in there that was related to wetness. And um, that was just a fascination for her. She would go into this little patch and find the little swamp maples. And of course, the paper birch bark was in there, you know, birch paper paper bark birch. And you know, what she asked us one day, almost casually, is I wonder if there are any others in Rhode Island. And it seemed like a really interesting question, you know, to a 10 year old, I'm thinking, well, gosh, there's two right in front of our house, it's got to be all over the place. So we went on the search, occasionally on these Sunday afternoon drives after church down in St. Paul, she'd jump us into the car, we get in the Belvedere station wagon and go on these expeditions. And this one was unusual because she usually took us to places where there was something. But this was uh, one of those negatives where we went proving that there weren't any other paper birch, <laughs> paper bark birches in Rhode Island, as far as we could find. And that led to all kinds of, you know, ancillary expeditions and other discoveries that weren't related to uh, the white paper birch. Mm -hmm. Paper bark birch. <laughs> I can't see it. I give up. You might have to have a little trouble editing that out there. Oh, Chris, <laughs> oh, good. I remember a further birch um, exploration, and you, uh, you probably remember this too, and Robbie, you, you would have been there. I don't know if Margie would have been this. Um, when One of those Sunday drives, she would take us on a Sunday when it was um, 
you know, looming over us, what are we going to do with these kids? And she would get us in the car and go somewhere. And usually it was within Rhode Island, but it, where, wherever we went in Rhode Island, anything more than 10 minutes felt like a long drive. And it was a good long drive. We loved long drives. So this time she took us to the Harvard Forest and um, in, up in Petersham, Mass. So that's, that was a long drive. And it was the fall. And I remember this really well because there's the Fisher Museum there that has these wonderful dioramas of the land around there and the history of the land, how it was, you know, the, the agricultural uses, the sheep, the so forth, and then the woods growing up just like in Rhode Island. And uh, the, of course the dioramas were so cool. So we did that and then we, um, clearly she was in her element and, but we liked it too. And so then we took some, a hike, um, a, cause there are trails around there. And sure enough, this is in my memory. And it's so funny that you bring up the birches. This woods is famous for these three, well, for birches, but there were three and she was pointing them out, the white, the yellow and the black. And she was pointing them out and describing how you could tell them apart. And um, uh, she would, you know, she would do this with all kinds of plants, not animals, plants. She liked plants <laughs> and rocks when she got into geology. Yeah. Um, but the way she talked about it was never lecturing. It was always just kind of like she was thinking out loud and of course responding to any questions we might have, but it was, that's a memory and it's a clear one. And on the way home, we stopped and picked, uh, got apples at a little roadside stand and that's how I know it was fall. But <laughs> that was a particularly nice Sunday drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and speaking to that, that business about, you know, Rhode Island and the flora, um, um, she wrote a paper in 1968 on the vegetation of Bottomless Valley. Uh, which is the woody area around our house, sort of below our house. You may have heard of that, but bottomless was a local name for a couple of ponds that Robbie can speak to the bottomlessness of those ponds. <laughs> 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 that is, they dried up in the summertime, at least one of them did. And the other had it was spring fed. So it had, uh, it's, you know, kept its water, but she loved that area. And so she wrote this paper, I came upon it, um, you know, this last December when I was going through the files that she left. And there were many other things that she had uh, collected and written and saved, but this one she wrote. And it's, um, you know, she had to have spent hours exploring those glacially carved areas uh, to put this paper together. It, it has seven tables, it's carefully cited, uh, both from the US Department of the Interior work, as well as interviews with Mrs. Brown, who was 90, and the Standevens, who lived down the street, who <clears throat> lived there for a generation or two, um, because they had memories that reached back the 75 years um, through the agricultural use of that land. So, you know, it was an eight page yellowed, kind of falling apart, hand typed manuscript um, <laughs> that, you know, as a 12 year old, when <clears throat> she was doing it, I was oblivious to this focused project of hers and uh, probably to many, many others. You know, it's, a, it's significant that it was 1968 because um, that was a huge time of upheaval in her life. It's amazing that she had the, uh, the presence of mind to go and do this. And maybe it was sort of uh, therapy for her, you know, to go out in the woods and, and collect, you know, collect her observations. Um, I got a feeling it's what kept her grounded, you know? It was tough time. You know, I was thinking back about the teenage episodes with her and Margie mentioned this uh, in her response yesterday. Um, there really weren't as many. When we were little, we were little sponges. Well, sponges on a string, you know? <laughs> what, are we gonna, what are we gonna do, say no, you know? <laughs> And then, and then as adults, you know, we sought her out because it was just fun being 10 years old again, you know, because she was perpetually 10 years old in her mature way. Um, in fact, it's informed my whole approach to teaching, especially teaching mariners, you know, if you can find a 10 year old in somebody, you can teach them anything. And my mom was uh, the primary example of 
bringing out the 10 year old because she had no compunction about being perpetually 10 years old herself in the, in the purest, most, you know, sublime sense of uh, the world around her is, is there for observation and, and understanding. You know? And I wanted to say one other thing before I, I, I stop the, you know, claiming this airspace here um, about Joyce's comment about moms being honored with this recognition. I wanted to add that the one thing she wouldn't do would be take this honor, Keith, she would not take it personally. It would be something that she would be glad for because it would be promoting the things that she found most important. It wouldn't be about her for one second and she'd tolerate that <laughs> fact of her name being associated with it just because she knew that it would help uh, preserve people's awareness of landscape and um, you know the vitality of it yeah that's yeah. exactly right chris <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah so robbie was the 10 year old that she um, was so glad to have when the three of us teenagers were yeah maybe less pleasant to be around. And <laughs> Ravi, can you remember any of your excursions? I know we have a picture of you in a, in a rock quarry, in a, a defunct rock quarry in Rhode Island. Yeah, yeah, we had a rock quarry in Rhode Island, that's for sure. <laughs> Climb up the cliff and chip off a piece of rock and, you know, the rock collection we had down in the basement. That was pretty precious. She would not uh, part with that thing, yeah. that, that collection. But, um, you know, those woods behind the house uh, was, I spent a lot of my life back there and, and um, she really made it special because she could, I don't make me aware of the surroundings more than probably most little kids would, you know, I mean, we, <clears throat> that pile of rocks over by um, Bottomless One was, uh, we thought an Indian grave, you know, but she, she made it clear, no, that was what the farmers did when they when a cow died. So it must be a cow under there. But, <laughs> I mean, we, we knew it was Indians. <laughs> but you know, that the, the, I think it was uh, mom that coined those the, the names of those ponds. I mean, it was bottomless. Really? Well, who came, didn't we come back? That was the, what we called them. And she I don't know. Yeah. accepted I don't know. that as the name and it became the name of those yeah. ponds. I don't think there was any formal name for those little puddles of mud, but uh, <laughs> we sure did have a lot of fun playing on them. If we weren't playing hockey on them or floating models out there or tromping around in the mud, sliding around on the ice. And yeah. you, you know, when it was frozen, you could get way back in there, way in there in the swamp. Yeah. You know, you couldn't move in there in the summertime. Yeah. You'd be up to your waist in mud and, and um, skunk weed and stuff. But I do remember one time um, we camped out, mom and I, Really? And uh, this was when I was in the Boy Scouts, so I was probably about nine. So I guess that would have been like, you know, 1971 or something, something like that. And we camped out one night overnight, and it was so she could take the temperatures of the water throughout the <laughs> night because she was convinced the pond was going to turn. You know, it was going to do that thing. It does. You know, it, yeah, inversion. And, uh, all the winter, and, and so it was a cold night. And she'd get up every hour out there and take a sample. You know. Oh. Like, and I was guarding the fort with a BB gun because I was sure, you know, there was a the woods get us. So I was the protector. She tolerated that. But that gave me my service. But that was a lot of fun. I'll remember that night for the rest of my life. And, and I pitched the tent while I was a little Boy Scout. Was trying to be. And we camped right on the side of Bottomless. I know right where it is. That, that little patch of trees there. and. I used to know those woods like the back of my hand, you know, we would walk around those woods and every single plant, she'd stop every 10 feet, you know, and point <laughs> something out. I was always in a big hurry to get where we were going. The most exciting places were, you know, where the creek cut through from the pond. Yeah. And then getting over to bottomless too, you had to get over the hump there and the trees in between those beautiful oak trees. And then you get over to the beach forest. Oh, yeah. that was my favorite area, you know, and we would stop there always mom and I we would stop there and spend time there and that little creek and that beach forest, you know, the little creek that ran out of bottomless too. I remember and I that. Went down and disappeared into that valley. It was woods as far as you could see, yeah. even though the highway was a little ways away and there was some houses and stuff, but you couldn't see them. So you had this sense like you were really in the forest. 
Yeah. But that uh, patch of beech trees was the coolest. Was the best for sure. The yellow, remember we'd be like under a golden dome. Yeah, you know, I miss that so much. It, you know, no matter where I've been in the world, th those woods are magical to me. And it was Mon that made them magical. It really was. But I spent a lot of time back there. And in my memory, I know it like the back of my hand. Yeah. It was, a, it was a tough time when I left to go to the academy. They came in with the bulldozers and put that housing development back there. And that really affected uh, Mom and I. We spent a lot of time talking about that. Wow. And, uh, you know, that's a... Reminds me that she, um, her way of coping with that, because it really was, it was the thing that we dreaded the whole time we lived there. When we moved there in 1963 or four, yeah, around there in winter, I think February. And Robbie, I know you were just a toddler. You're two years old when we moved there. And um, even as early as I can remember, there was talk, and it was mommy who was kind of worried that they would be that there was planned to build back there. Um, yeah. As early as that, it didn't happen till you went to the academy, Robbie, and that was what, 86? No, that was in 81. I left in 81. 81. They started, okay. And then they built the overpass, the Route 4 thing and that all. Yeah. And so she, when it was inevitable, she started going back there with her camera and she recorded, first of all, she took many pictures of what was growing and then she, um, you know, regularly recorded with her pictures uh, the changes that were taking place and even the most painful um, yeah. places, things that were happening, you know, watching this beautiful woods be taken apart. But it always amazed me how she, she sort of said, okay, then, um, I, you know, it wasn't like she was, if you can't beat them, join them. It was more like, all right, it's happening. We better watch it. We'll just watch what's happening and see it and remember it and face it and see what can be picked up from the changes. We encountered that um, sand pit when we first moved there. And she, you know, to her credit, she didn't, um, you know, bemoan the fact that it had been scoured out already. I mean, the sand pit wasn't a natural thing. She would take us, and I remember one day with her, she, she was with me down there. We were looking at that steep slope that went up from the sand pit and climbed the first ridge. You remember that? And oh, it, yeah. was, it was really gravelly. And uh, it had clearly been excavated by a bulldozer. In fact, there was some stray um, cylindrical concrete tubes that, that belonged to culvert construction. And the, so mom encountered this not only as a glacial moraine, but she also encountered it as a scoured out piece of ground that was being used for, you know, modern purposes. And that's when she started to explain to me about, um, and I don't have the words for it, I know you could help me out, but it was um, the type of uh, ecology where after a disaster like an avalanche or a, some kind of a landslide, there would be this growth of certain kinds of bushes and trees with root systems that would hold the soil together. And so for her, you know, even the fact that it was scarred and beat up already and no longer its pristine glacial dump or till, she would be able to explain or take a moment and show us something that was meaningful about it, even in the midst of its being abused. And that's, that was the teacher in her, you know, it was, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little choked up just remembering it. It was very personal. Yeah. yeah. That patch of sand, you know, that was, uh, there was all kinds of different sand there, right? And she described how it all worked with the glacier and the way it retreated and what was being left by the glacier as it melted. Um, I don't know, was it like an alder? I can't remember exactly, yeah. but there were yeah. rows of little trees in there. That place was just fascinating. And you know, it, it, we would never have seen it that way, but it made it so magical. She could make it so magical. You could walk back there any season, and that's what I love about Rhode Island. You have these crazy seasons, and they're so, you know, radically different from each other. That it, just like the sand pit, you had on one side something completely different than on another. Up and over the ridge, it was a different kind of forest and ponds. The sand pit was like a desert. You had the fields that was like the plains. Yeah, you know, you had it all. 
<laughs> it was like the whole country in one little condensed spot, like a perfect little playground for everybody, not only us, but mom, you know, and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She did. She did a wonderful job of teaching you about succession without making it painful. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. That's, we could do a, a quick reset to welcome Margie and Hope. We yeah. we started part of it a little bit early because Chris has to take a ferry, so we wanted to get Chris while he was available. And then we'll kind of do a restart in a little bit too. So I just want to let you, so you guys didn't know what was going on, but this just happened kind of recently, but we wanted to make sure that we got Chris too. So we'll do a restart in a, in a little bit. Okay. Well, I just wanted to tag on to what you were saying, Chris, because I was, um, I don't know when it started. I don't know how old your mom was when we started doing this. <laughs> But she must have been at least in her 70s and up until her, she, you know, the year or two years before she went to live at Atria, um, out in her little kayak. And we would look for aquatic plants. And a lot of the places we were in were in the, um, the yes. kettle hole ponds in the glacial moraine. And that was something that we would just talk about endlessly is imagining what this landscape looked like um yeah. post glacial and <laughs> so she was right there with you i think <laughs> i was trying to you know think of all the things that that we did together because i i guess i met her keith when she was your grad student yeah exactly and, you know and then we were both in the wa watershed watch together and the wild plant society and you know all the kayaking and I should tell you this story now because this is about the only thing I can tell that is um, that the other my other sibs can't tell because I was you know like two and three and they still weren't well Chris was born he was in diapers but um, anyway she when we, at that time we lived on the uh, where there's a shipyard now in Whitford Harbor and um, it, at that time it was a it's not a shipyard actually now it's a yacht place where people park their yachts and there's like a gas pump and they get gas there for their yachts but back in the day it was a shipyard where they actually built ships like a Popeye you know and um, my father worked with those people and that we lived they gave us a shack to live in because we didn't have any money so we lived in this little one room shack which is now part of the um, yachting store. You know, there's the old house, which is the shack, old part, and then there's the new part attached to it. So anyway, we lived in this shack and um, it was right on the water. And between the shack and the water where it was a slope and there were, it was, it was eel grass, you know, or that grass, this little snails grow on, you know, that sp Spartina, I think. And, you know, the sharp, dark, very vibrant green, you know, like, what's that shade of green, like Kelly green, that bright green grass, and it grows in the marsh and everything. And um, in there, in that grass, she had a rowboat, this gray rowboat. And we used to go to the store in the rowboat. So we would row across Wickford Harbor. And um, she put me in the boat. And, you know, I would watch her row. And of course, I was two going on three. And I mean, I wanted to, I thought it was the coolest thing because the row, the oars were in these rubber gaskets. And it was just so cool to see like the way the or, you know, kind of, I don't know, fit in there. And it seemed so easy when she did it, you know, she did something that we would just float, move along, you know, make a little wake and everything. And, um, but she was, you know, she taught me like, a, this is where she started to introduce me to the animals in the yard. So there were snails, you know, and, um, and then when we got to the place where we would put the boat up on the rocks and climb up over the bridge and go across the street to go over to Ryan's. Well, there was a rat. He was big, big brown rat. And so I was like, mommy, is that like a kitty? You know? And she goes, no, that's a rat. <laughs> we had a kitty, but I mean, it looks sort of like a kitty, like it was big, it was as big as a cat and it was brown. And, um, and so she introduced me to my first rat. And then, um, and she taught me, you know, songs and stuff in the boat so that by going in that rowboat, then when she started reading us stories like the owl and the pussycat and the, um, 
and the uh, the other one about the three wink and blink and a nod, you know, in the boat. Um, I mean, I had like a, a context, you know, and and that was just the beginning. I mean, my, I, my life was so the memories of that time in my life are are just ecstatic because of you know the water, the being outdoors and being outdoors with mommy, you know, and just making it so like this is where we belong you know like if we were indians or something like that and we we live in the outdoors we don't live in the indoors we live in the outdoors and then when we moved to another house it was more like a suburban type little you know little ranch house with a yard and everything real yard i mean not like the spartina i mean it's like a kind of yard where everybody knows it's a yard okay then there were everything lived in that yard there were turtles there were toads there were little garter snakes there were ladybugs and all different kinds of animals you know all the bugs that live in the grass like um you know grasshoppers and walking sticks and you know different butterflies and everything and and the, and so she introduced me to all those animals so they were like my friends i could play with them and um she taught me about the flowers you know the different seasons like first the daffodils i mean first the um dandelions come then the buttercups you know then we'd go out into this field where there were daisies and then after that you'd have like the queen anne's lace and you know she just taught me about sort of the, how the seasons associate with the different flowers and so anyway that was my happy time <laughs> learning <laughs> learning botany from my mother <laughs> basics basics you know <laughs> but it was really fun a lot of long walks in the woods you know looking at violets and um going to this little pond where there were more turtles and skates that went across the water and dragonflies and um you know it was nice <laughs> hope i didn't put everybody to sleep <laughs> i'm sorry uh, not at not at all <laughs> no that's that great. so vivid <laughs> Just... hope do you remember when she she i remember her telling me that she was in the middle of um was it um, Springs? What's the name of the pond right along Route 2? Silver sil Springs? Silver Springs. Silver Springs. She was determined to catch the turn, you know, when it goes from hot to cold. That was a big thing, you know, to catch that moment. And she right, did. Right, when it turns and, over. Yeah. yeah. And she got out in the middle of that in her kayak, and she was probably 90 then, you know. I mean, it was near not yeah. that long ago. Yeah, and, I uh, was such an impressive person <laughs> by herself right, pulling that right. out of the her jeep you know yeah. having the seat removed so she could get the kayak in yeah. she was an inspiration for a whole lot of people that knew what she was up to and and uh, she told me that story i couldn't believe it you remember what she said about her her um forays on to um warden's pond how she might uh, she'd go out there, it'd be super calm and it would be just heaven. And then a wind would come up by the time it was time to go back, but it was the wrong way. And it was yeah. like, so she, she found an umbrella and she brought it with her, right? <laughs> Put it in the kayak. Yeah, but it was a clear umbrella so she could see through. <laughs> well, I don't know. Where she, was going. she was prepared and she had several runs of, of before the wind in her kayak. You know, that, that umbrella was doing the work. She was so pleased with that. <laughs> yeah, that ingenuity. I mean, I remember one time she was telling me about going out onto a bog with snowshoes on because that made her feel safe. She wasn't going to go through the sphagnum mat. Because she had done that before. And yeah. that. <laughs> In fact, I think it was on Bottomless too, because that's where she found the floating island. This would have been in the 80s, maybe? Remember that? Yeah. She, that's probably when she got the hip, weight, the hip, hip waders, you know? Because she didn't want that to happen again. And she, she did say it was a little scary, because... Yeah. Um, you know, you get, go through the mat and it's maybe four feet deep and it's very muddy and she's alone and she's in her sixties at that point, probably maybe seventies. Yeah. <laughs> that was our mother. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's yeah. really interesting to hear you describe the, the teacher side of her because 
I, I didn't know her very well. She came to the office a few times to give me it, it, piles of data that she had collected or to, to help Lisa Gould, you know, go through data to produce something. I knew the stops and looks at everything and makes a note about it person, not the teacher person. So it's very interesting to hear you describe that part of her. Well, you've, you've given me a thought, David. Let me share something that I know Margie and, and um, Joyce will remember. I'm not so sure about Robbie. You were, um, I'm not even sure if you were born yet. Um, so you would appreciate it from an abstract standpoint. But mom used to read to us when we were little as a threesome. And uh, so she wasn't just, uh, you know, an intrepid explorer. She was an adventurer in storytelling and not her own story. She read to us, um, well, the one that I really remember that's always stuck with me, Joyce, you kind of brought it back with the Wonder Lake thing, was um, Swallows and Amazons. Yeah, she loved and, that book. Yeah, and she read it to us because she wanted to have some companions in her adventures um, as she read, you know, she wanted to just, <laughs> she wanted to have this fun and she wanted to bring us along too. Well, we had her as a teacher, you and I, Joyce. Yes, we did. What do you remember of that? Well, getting up awfully early and driving all the way to Rocky Hill <laughs> and then staying there very late because she had to have her teachers meetings in the afternoon. And by the time we got back, it was dark and it was killing <laughs> That was an amazing time though. You know, we spent a lot of time together. We'd drive all the yeah. way there. We'd get up early in the morning together, have our little breakfast together and leave and drive all the way to Rocky Hill. It had to be at least 25 minutes, you know. Mummy talked about you, Keith, and you hope a lot. Your names were oh, in, yeah. in, in her regular, you know, conversations about stuff she'd been doing or people she'd been with. and. And it's nice to, to see you here together, you know, your faces and, and I've always had those names. Of course, I've met you, Keith. Hope, I think I met you years ago, um, but your name is rolls off my tongue as easily as anything because of just the involvement that you, uh, you and, and Keith too had with her over the last 30 years, which was really her, her time. I mean, I think she, yeah. You know, you both probably know a little bit about her, but she um, she married on the late side, but mar married because she told us this because you know there was a lot of pressure to do that, and um, she said uh, around the time she was getting divorced or so a few years later, she said, "Well, you know," she said, "but she turned bright and she said, but if I hadn't married your daddy, I wouldn't have you." before and I that's where she left it that was all she really wanted to say uh -huh. and um she when that was that was a kind of a raising us kids was a time where she put aside all the vision that she had for herself she you know while we she was raising us she was reading uh, we didn't get you know ladies home journal to our great <laughs> dismay because then we couldn't get all the garbage the ads the the big pictures that she got uh, Scientific American, but um, <laughs> that stupid Ameri uh, Scientific American would sit on the coffee table and there'd be no reason to sit down. <laughs> no reason to sit down, right? <laughs> and, and the, the, other, the other two publications were Nature and Science. That's, well, that's right. I don't know. Yeah. She may have gotten those in our youth, but she definitely got them later. Mm -hmm. um, so she kept herself sane um, by reading, keeping in, you know, her field as much as she could. Although she did say that it got harder and harder to keep up with a lot of the, the articles um, as science moved on without her. And uh, so up. it was really uh, the, the divorce plus, you know, I really probably less that and more our growing up and leaving that finally of. opened up her life again to her. And she didn't waste any time. She had to go back to work with a divorce. So that was teaching that she knew she could do, but she went to URI and took courses in, in um, geology and calculus and um, just, she had to brush up and uh, she did that. And she loved it, of course, that whole business with the rock collection and you know, oh, the, um, 
one time we were on our way to, to New Jersey to her brother's house uh, for Thanksgiving, our cousins. And uh, this time she wanted to do a, a detour and the detour was Palisades Parkway. Robbie, you've got to remember this. Oh, I do. I remember, so I remember this. We're driving along the Palisades Parkway, this, this cliff's going up along the narrow road, you know, and mom pulls over in that Plymouth station wagon. This will only take a few minutes. So she gets out and gets the pickaxe out of the back. <laughs> out with her. And for about 15 minutes or so, she is hacking away at Palisades Parkway <laughs> and putting the rocks um, in the back. And then we, then, we, <laughs> then we go on our merry way and, you know. I look at landscape and I see trees with notches dug into them from the old days of, of the tree cutters. And I think of her, I think of what would she be telling me about? I go on uh, interpretive trails, you know, in places she hadn't been. And I thought, oh man, she would love this walk. <laughs> she would tell me all about it. We would look into it together. We'd find out the differences between uh, this kind of Western red cedar and something else, you know? Yeah. Yeah. She's there. She's always present. Yeah. And that's, you know, I mean, for being nominated for the Natural History Award. I mean, that's, she's, was always learning. She never stopped learning mm -hmm. and, and as well as teaching, but, and sharing, but that was what, one of the things that impressed me so much about her was yeah. her life was just a passion for experiencing it and learning from it. Uh, it's well put. It's well put. It's exactly right. And I'm glad you're honoring that because that's the that's the legacy that that we can all expand on and take with us. You know, that's the, the generational expansion of, of things that's going to make it better. I wanted to just, you know, thank ev everybody, uh, the kids and and Keith and Pete and Hope for putting this together. I, it, I, it's been tremendously instructive and um I'm very grateful for you taking the time to do this um, and the, for the opportunity uh, that we have to put something together um, that will hopefully convey something of, of the same stories and warmth that you've shared to our larger audience. And um, it's really gr grateful and, and I wanna say thank you for that. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you. For thank all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.